All right, so I'm going to be talking to you about neuroaxial ultrasound. And I hope that at the end of this lecture, those of you who don't use uh, the technique will adopt it. And just for a show of hands, who actually uses pre-procedure ultrasound before doing epidurals? Who has an awareness of it? Okay. All right, so we've got a few minds to change. So I'm going to answer just two questions, okay? Why should we do bother doing this? And how can we do it? Um, and the reason why I think, you know, the, the reason for the hand is the title of the future. I mean, it's important that we do adopt technology. We do critically appraise if it's necessary or not, but we do need to adopt it. Otherwise, slowly but surely, you do get left behind. So um, I hope you sort of think this through in terms of the importance of adopting it. So a few just quick disclosures. Um, the only one relevant to this talk is my uh, relationship with Ravana, who gave some and uh, uh, research funding, and I do sort of pro bono consulting to them, and I'll show you the device that they do later on. All right, so why should you do this? Well, our patient population has changed, unfortunately, and we're not only de dealing with obese patients now, but we deal with the super morbid obese patient, and you can see landmarks can be really, really tricky. And if you have a look over here, there's a little bit of puncture, several little sites tried, and that was a failed block, so they moved up to here in labor, and then you can see the catheter going up there, and basically uh, a few hours later, she's in the OR having a block replaced again. So it can be particularly challenging finding uh, the right place in these particular patients. We also have these patients, the scoliotic patients, previous back surgeries, all that can make neuroaxial uh, placement or spinal placement, um, uh, spinals or epidurals, very tricky. All right, so without using the ultrasound, this is what you know when you approach a patient's back. You really don't know anything. You may, if you can feel the interspaces, you can get an idea of where to go, and you have some idea of midline, but you have no understanding of depth or which interspace you're at, okay? If you put the ultrasound on a patient's back, you can get all of this information before you stick a needle in for your spinal or your epidural, okay? You can determine accurately which interspace you're in as opposed to guessing, and I'll show you how badly we are at guessing. You can clearly determine midline. You can get a very good estimate of depth, so you can plan what equipment you need and also when you expect to get loss of resistance. You can actually look for which interspace might be better, and we've all had the experience where you struggle on one interspace and you move up one and it goes in easily. Was the space bigger? Was, was there a reason why one was better than the other? And you can often see that by the acoustic window. And you can get an idea of how you should angle your needle based on the angulation you need with your ultrasound probe. All right. so. Why are we that bad at estimating which interspace? Well, we use the iliac crest or intercrystal line or Tuffier's line, and unfortunately there's huge variability, and this has been shown in a number of studies. We tend to get it wrong, and we tend to be one to two interspaces higher than we think we are, which is a problem because you think the, the spinal cord ends at L1, we've been told that, but there's huge variation. About almost 20% of patients have spinal cord ending below that. Okay, um, so there can be where you tend to be higher and the spinal cord is actually lower than you think. Okay, so not great landmarks that we have to use. And is there a problem with that? Well, yes, there are. Uh, there's not only just theoretical concerns where you can actually d um, damage the conus or get neurological injury because of it, but there are several case series and reports of conus injuries. And again, like I mentioned, you've got that imbalance between where we are going, we tend to be higher than we think we are, and spinal cords that have variation can be much lower, it can be all the way down to L3 where it terminates. And there is an association where you have uh, epidural hematomas that tend to be more associated with difficult blocks. So you have a difficult block, you're more likely to get an epidural hematoma. Now clearly they're very rare, but they often are associated with traumatic placements. All right, so what about the depth estimation? So we have many studies, we have good evidence, level 1A evidence, uh, that you can use the ultrasound very precisely to be able to determine the depth. So the correlations are almost perfect between the depths that you measure in ultrasound versus actual depth of the needle. And the differences in studies range from zero to eight millimeters. So you can know within a, within a centimeter when you're gonna get loss of resistance, which is very useful when you're advancing a needle. In obese patients, you may get a slight difference because, in other words, the confidence intervals may be a little bit bigger because of the pro pressure and often more difficult visualization. So your confidence intervals may increase in that population. And just remember not, if you are measuring the depth, to try and release a bit of that pro pressure when you're doing it and to account for your angulation difference between your needle and your ultrasound probe that derived this depth, okay? But it is, a very, it is very, very accurate at, at, at being able to give you a depth measurement. 
Now I mentioned about turning, uh, choosing the optimal interspace. This is a clever study that looked at uh, changes uh, of the uh, neuroaxial space uh, during gestation, during pregnancy. And they were looking at three interspaces, L2, 3, th 3, 4, and 4, 5, looking at how much you can see. So both the depth to the space and the interlaminal and, 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 dural, uh, and dural mater visible uh, distance. And the, the conclusion of the study essentially was that L2, 3 was the easiest space. I'm not recommending you go into L2, 3, but this is the concept of you can actually mark out and say, hey, that space is better because it's bigger area that I can stick a needle in. So you've got, I can see more dura, more target to actually hit, okay? So you can actually, and I, this is in a um, parasagittal uh, view uh, that, the, that the photograph was taken for consistency, but in a transverse view, you can easily see if you have better interspaces to go into. All right, does it improve uh, efficacy of insertion? So again, we have lots of evidence. If you pull the randomized control studies and the cohort studies, you have almost 2,000 patients. Um, it will halve your technical failures, so uh, a relative risk of 0.51. It can decrease needle passes both by increasing first pass success as well as reducing the number of redirects. And while you do use time to use the ultrasound, it can save you time during the actual procedure and you can offset a lot of that. So we have fairly good evidence for the efficacy of uh, block insertion, both in depth determination and um, improving uh, insertion. Now, most studies are conducted in the obviously normal population without comorbidities, non-obese patients. There are a few scattered in those meta-analysis, but the emphasis is usually trialing these devices on uh, patients who don't have these three. So these are the ones that give us more technical issues, and like I mentioned, these are the ones we want it for. So what's the evidence that ultrasound actually helps in this population? So uh, we have the answer. There was lots of like case reports of, hey, I had a really challenging patient, I used ultrasound and it worked great. Uh, but this is a randomized control study from the Toronto group uh, and patients who were obese, who had previous back surgery and who were scoliotic, were randomized to traditional palpation technique versus ultrasound based. And using that, they doubled their success rate, they halved their needle uh, passes. Uh, it took a little bit of time to establish the landmarks in, and a little bit longer than a, a normal weight individual. Um, uh, but you save a little bit of time with actual uh, procedure because you had your landmarks determined. So here's the evidence for that triad of terrible that they call it, the obese patient, scoliotic, and previous back surgery. Most of this was driven by obesity, um, so the efficacy in that. So beyond obesity, we've all had this uh, situation where you go and do an epidural and you're just feeling patients back and you feel and you're like, yeah, can't really feel spinous process and you feel again and you, mm, okay, I think it's there and you go for it. So this study is clever in the way that what they did is if you had that situation, I know it's subjective, but just where you don't feel good landmarks, you either then went for the traditional or the ultrasound based, okay? So that was the tr decision tree. It wasn't based on a BMI cutoff. In fact, in the study, you can see the BMIs are actually comparable, which goes against this whole idea of BMIs being difficult, necessarily causing difficult placements, because in many ways it's a global measure and it's fat distribution that's a lot more important. We actually just completed a study looking exactly at that. Fat distribution is a lot more important than a global measure, but for what it's worth, these are patients where you just don't have a very good feel. And this would give you um, some evidence to say it's worth the ultrasound, you're going to decrease your needle passes, and you don't add time. So the time you take to then ultrasound a patient is made up uh, by being able to locate the um, epidural space quicker. So what about ongoing if efficacy? So there's several studies that show you get improved uh, um, beyond the insertion that I was uh, discussing. Um, you get improved analgesia as well as maternal satisfaction, uh, and these are cohort studies. Uh, one reason may be that you're more likely midline, so you get better distribution of local anesthetic. The other one is those false loss resistance where you think you're in, you're not in. Uh, perhaps that contributes to what uh, has been observed in other studies. The level of evidence here is less than um, the evidence for insertion improvements. So what about safety? Uh, again, if you turn to the meta-analysis, remember these are always secondary outcomes, so in no way are you um, designing studies to look at these outcomes, but less traumatic placement has been shown if you pull an, uh, um, the meta-analysis data, and I showed you the association between traumatic placements and the risk of epidural hematoma. 
We have not shown that it decreases um, dural puncture, accidental dural puncture, and it's going to be very tricky to ever show that because of the numbers you need, it need because it's such a rare event. Um, so the current level of evidence is three for secondary outcomes of safety. So there's a lot of theoretical reasons why it may be more safe, uh, but we haven't got the evidence to prove that yet. And unfortunately, there's some things that we will n or n generally struggle to show evidence for. A lot of the outcomes, and in particular, dural puncture, uh, will be one of those. And they've never done a randomized control study to show a parachute works, but we inherently know parachute works. So there's some things that sort of make common sense. Knowing that you're going to get loss resistance within a centimeter is useful, whether or not you can prove that it decreases your your wet tap rate, but it's really up to you to try and make, uh, make use of the evidence that we have. All right, so that's the why we should do it, and that's all the up latest evidence on that. So we're going to move on to how do you do it. Um, and for those who are not that familiar with ultrasound, it kind of can be frightening, uh, this is a relatively <coughs> easy procedure to do. And if I think of all the applications that we use ultrasound for, this is in the range of easy. Um, and I'll prove it. This is a study looking at the learning curve both comparing ultrasound versus traditional. Uh, and the solid black line is uh, ultrasound. You can see the learning curve to get competency was actually quicker than the traditional technique. There's an interesting editorial, which the reference uh, is on the slide by Kessler, that, that looked at various studies that have tried to determine how many procedures do you need with ultrasound uh, epidurals, or just for epidurals per se, to tr get competence. And there's such a variation amongst individuals, it's very difficult to pinpoint. That magical number of 50 get, comes out there, but in some individuals after 10, 20 uh, competencies reach. But the learning curve actually is very quick and um, I I very similar to um, normal um, traditional ultrasounds. All right, so we have e equipment issues. Uh, the fortunate thing in obstetrics is every single obstetric unit has an ultrasound machine. So you can actually just use the uh, one on labor and delivery, and it comes with a curvilinear probe, so just take it from the OBs and you have your device. There is some advantage to the more sophisticated devices because you can manipulate the image a little bit better, but there is a number of portable devices which we've tr uh, trialed as well as used that give you perfectly good image, uh, images to be able to use. So uh, we have an, a non-equipment issue. In other areas in anesthesia, it can be a problem having the equipment, but we have it every day on OB, so just use it. Um, Knobology, for people who are not that familiar with ultrasound machine, can be a little daunting, and you put a few mocks, uh, as we have done, in our little ultrasound machine, and uh, uh, there's really three things you have to control. You have to basically turn it on, turn on 2D mode, play around with your depth, and tweak your gain. So it's not that you need that much to actually do an, an ultrasound, and even with sophisticated machines, um, you can simplify it just by marking off errors. So most people view bone as the enemy of ultrasound because it creates a lot of artifact and ultrasounds cannot get beyond bone. But the idea behind imaging here is to use the artifacts that you see um, to create images and patterns that you use. Okay, so the first one is the bony landmark. So you're going to look for spinous process. We're going to see lamina. We're going to see these articular process. And if you look at that image, just remember how much bony mass there is on those articular process. And you'll see that's why we get a particular type of artifact. And then you've got your transverse process. It goes across over there. And then from a soft tissue point of view, we're essentially looking at two parts. We're looking at the posterior complex, which is made up of the ligaments and flavum, and the dura. You can't actually differentiate in all patients the two different ones. So, it's, so by convention, you take them all together, and you measure in the inside of the surface. And I'll show you that in a little while. For the anterior complex, you're looking at the vertebral bodies and the ligaments that run on the inside of those. So posterior anterior complex and the bony landmarks. And that's what we're looking at when we use ultrasound. And then they create characteristic uh, 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 patterns and that you'll recognize uh, b based on both hypo and hypoechoic imaging. You're going to get a sawtooth pattern, okay, and I'll show you that. You're going to see a cone sign and then a bat's ears or an equal sign. And if you see those three patterns, that's all you need to kind of look for. And we're very good at pattern recognition as humans. We're designed to notice patterns and we can see it in a snowstorm. Even in difficult ultrasounds, if you do enough, you can pick it up very quickly. So we start with the probe in the, vertebral, uh, in, the, uh, in the vertical orientation, and you slide it up, you see a long hypoechoic line, and that's going to be the hypoechoic line, and that's the sacrum. And the first interspace in there is between S1 and L5, and that's the sawtooth pattern. 
I'm going to show you a slightly better image of that. This gives you a better impression of uh, the sawtooth going up and down. Um, what is better than having it in the vertical position in the midline is a parasagittal oblique. So you're slightly off midline and you angle the probe medially. And that gets you into a nice acoustic window. And how you know you're in the right window is you get that sawtooth pattern. And what you're looking for is the posterior complex, which again, like I mentioned, is the ligaments and flavum and dura, and um, the anterior complex. And you count up uh, these interspaces to determine which interspace you're going to go into. Okay? Um, so that's the vertical orientation, parasagittal oblique. When you get to where you want, you flip the probe transverse. And if you are on the spinous process, you get a hyperechoic structure there with a characteristic shadowing afterwards. Okay? Some people call it a cone sign. Others will say it's a man with a cape. And g given the fact that there's a bat next, you're like kind of in that same sort of scene. But whatever you want to look at. And the good thing about this is you'll always see this. It's close to the probe. No matter how obese the patient is, you will see spinous process. And that equals midline. Then you've determined where midline is. So it's a very important landmark. A lot of people get frustrated when they see that. For me, it's I've determined midline. And this is the bat's ears that I mentioned. So you're now between the interspace. Uh, that bat's ears are there. And this is the sort of mouth. Uh, some people say you just look for the equal sign, okay? And you'll notice the hyperechoic structures off on the side there. That's the transverse process, which actually corresponds with your posterior complex. So if you can never see that equal sign, and you can see your transverse process, which you can always see, even in obese patients, you know that's where you're going to get depth, loss of resistance depth. So it's a very good surrogate marker for that. All right, so you've now got your probe in the position. You're between this, and you're going to see that again. You're not going to see labels when you're doing the ultrasound, just be warned. Um, so there's your transverse process. Here's your articular process. Remember I showed you that bony mass on the... So you're going to get so much bone there that you're going to get this characteristic shadow. So that's what sends you what's giving you those um, bat's ears. Um, and this is your spinal canal. So this is where all your nerves are. Sometimes you can actually see a few individual nerves hanging down. So you can actually see the little cord equina. You can see a few little dots there. Um, and then there's your um, anterior complex, so your posterior gel, okay? Um, and then when you determine that, you're going to me measure it, uh, and you're going to measure by convention to the inside of that posterior complex, okay? And that's going to give you a depth estimate. Um, and um, as I showed you, it's a very good correlation with that and what you can actually find. So this is a pre-procedure technique. So you're going to do all that. You're going to optimize your image. You're going to get the image not only as good as you can get it, you're going to get it as symmetrical as possible, and then you're going to mark it off. And by convention, you mark off those two. Pretty easy to do. You join the two lines, and you've got your mark there. What you'll notice when you mark on this side, it's kind of difficult to see exactly where that. So that I find those markings tend not to be as accurate as the one in the middle of the probe. Okay? And it's actually worthwhile, some um, probes actually have a little bit of marks, but or you can create a little mark to see where your center of your probe is. Um, a technique that's described, you can flip your probe over this way to get a better accurate lateral marking if you want. That's a technique that's described. And another technique I found is where you just hold the probe instead of marking it and then just create a little indentation uh, with a, a needle cap. Um, so use any technique you want. Just make sure when you're cleaning it off that you can still see where you've marked. Um, and uh, there's a, the, uh, the Acura device, which I'll show you in a little while, made by Ravana. They actually have a thing that slides off the probe and indents it, which I think a lot of probes will start coming with these indentation covers. So those are the beautiful images you get in nice, thin individuals. The biggest problem when is when you apply it to the difficult patients, like I mentioned, you're going to be so disappointed because you're going to expect to see this beautiful bat sears, cone sign, everything, and you just don't kind of see what you want to see. But you can always get information no matter how bad your image is. You can always see spinous process, so you have a midline estimation. You can always, always see transverse process, so it gives you an idea of depth. Uh, you remember, you can measure depth in two ways. You can do it with a transverse orientation where you count in. You can also do it parasagittally where you look into that acoustic window. So if you're struggling to get a nice depth estimation in that way, you can turn the probe parasagittally. And that corresponds very well with the transverse measurements. So between those depth estimations using, if you can see the equal sign, great. But if you can't, estimate from your transverse process and then image optimization, and that's why some of the more fancy ultrasounds help you because you can really focus into the area you want to. 
Uh, the more portable devices don't work quite as well because it just gives you a sort of global view. Um, but don't be disappointed, you can get a lot of information. And just as an example, case in point, this is no, I mean, obviously I'm not palpating this back, but there's no way that I would have marked that out. I mean, it would be a good two centimeters off midline in that individual. All right, so obviously I'm showing you a lot of uh, images, static images, so I want to give you a dynamic image. So there you go, there's your sacrum, so hypercoic structure. This is your first interspace, so this is L, uh, S, L5, S1. There's your posterior complex, and there's a hint of your anterior complex. You would measure the depth to that point, okay, as I'm showing you over there. Um, and we use this view purely to count up, okay? So you're counting up the interspaces, so we've got um, now to L4, 5, and then to 3, 4, and a little tweaking to optimize it, and then I'm just going to flip the probe to get back into the midline, and that's just a repeat of the same image. And again, when you flip the probe transverse, uh, if you're in the interspace, you get this. This is transverse process. Remember I showed you how it corresponds quite nicely with the posterior complex. You've got your articular processes here and all the shadowing that you get after that. This is your vertebral body. If you hit that, you've definitely gone too far. <laughs> yeah. And um, so you get some image. And then I'm going to deliberately flip from interspace to spinous process and then back down again. So we're going to go there. I'll flip up to the spinous process deliberately, hit it, you can see that, little cone sign thing, and then back again there. And this is a perfect image. This is actually a pregnant resident, so it's a real image created in a real patient. Uh, but this is clearly a nice um, ultrasound image, and you can struggle a lot more with other images, but you can always get a lot of information from it, no matter what. All right, so where are we heading in the future? So the future, some of the future I'm going to discuss is actually already here. And the first one is this device I was mentioning. And again, I have a conflict because I did get research funding from this company. Um, it's, I was a little skeptical that it would work, but it's pretty impressive. It creates um, pattern recognition. Um, it has software to basically tell you where it thinks the interspace is, and it gives you a reading of the depth. So you just go along and you go, oh, there's my depth. It's 3.9 in this particular, and you just mark off and you move up to the next interspace. Pretty easy to use. We've recently studied it. It's, um, within seven millimeters of the actual um, puncture or, um, for the uh, needle placement. And in, compared to a more fancy console type ultrasound machine, it was within uh, three millimeters. So it's, uh, it gives you a fairly accurate divide. So it might be helpful to individuals who feel too overwhelmed by this pattern recognition. The concern I have with this device is the really difficult patients, the morbid obese patient where you're trying to see and this is where it may not work as well. It hasn't been studied. Um, so that's the big limitation with this device, I think. Uh, the other thing where we're moving towards is actually using it to work out where your catheter is for epidurals. Not that good just getting in. Can we actually see it? So this is a study that used TEE, okay, so transesophageal echo, uh, during cases they would do dose up their um, epidural and look for the spread of the local. And it was more posterior compared to lateral. They didn't see the spread. It worked better, both for pain as well as the analgesic needs. So there was some ability to actually localize where their catheter was lying. Um, and that same concept has been applied to lumbar epidurals. It's more difficult to see it in the lumbar region, and obviously with our normal ultrasound as opposed to um, transesophageal echo. Um, so they were using color Doppler as well as M mode and reasonable detection rates of 68 and 75 percent. So it's something that if you're struggling with locating your epidural, if you want to withdraw it and you're trying to work out if it's lying where you want to, you can apply this technology. Again, the imaging is not that good to make this, and that's why I think this is more of a future direction as image quality improves. And this is clearly the future is improvement in both 3D or 4D ultrasound, uh, using GPS location of your needle so you can do real-time placement, you can free up a hand. Um, there are um, individuals who do real-time placement. It requires a certain skill set. I'm concerned that you may increase risk because you don't visualize your needle. I don't think it's ready for prime time. Um, you can see just the setup that's involved with some of these. Um, but ultimately, I think it might become that as our standard as, as the technology improves. All right, so this is really the option up to you. You know why we should do it or how. So do you apply it in every single patient? Um, I don't know if the evidence is there yet. 
uh, it was interesting watching the evolution of central lines as they came along. Initially, people kept saying, oh, there's more complications. They eventually had enough data. Then there was meta-analysis to sh prove it was safer. And eventually, we swapped over to no one would do it in an elective setting ever without an ultrasound. We're not there yet with this at all. We may eventually get there. Um, I don't know. But the evidence is slowly moving towards it. The same way as you wouldn't go and puncture someone 20, 30 times before getting the ultrasound out for a peripheral IV. I think it's in that domain of, you know, we should be thinking of an ultrasound device if you're struggling. Um, should you apply for the difficult patients? I've shown you some evidence, the obese patients, scoliotic previous back surgery, the patient who's, who's had a previous wet tap, like what happened, a failed block, that's where we applied. If someone's block's not working, we'll take out the ultrasound and see what's, what caused it for the subsequent one. Uh, it could be a screening tool as part of your pre-op consultation. Just check someone's back out, mark it off for later. Again, you need to find where you think you're going to apply in your practice. Probably the wrong answer is to say, I have seen no indication for it. Uh, and somewhere in between is probably the right answer as we currently are. With future real-time placements, you'll really have uh, much more options and it'll probably impress more people in terms of how useful it is. So I encourage you to consider using it. And if you do, you may uh, get a... a <laughs> Maybe named after you with the epidural placement. And that is that.